Um, now, this is the final session of our International Law in Review uh, Conference. This is session six, which is the book launch on the making of the modern law of the sea by the late Ambassador Satya Nandan. Um, Emil will put a, a link to the book in the chat. And um, to chair the session, we have, of course, uh, Prof. Uh, Tommy Ko, who needs no introduction. Prof. Ko? Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Tara. Um, this is a very important book. I consider this one of the most important books which has been written on the making of the modern law of the sea, on uh, Satyan Nandan's unique ability to uh, capture consensus. Uh, since the time is short, uh, I will call on the four speakers. Uh, the first speaker is Christine Dalaka. Christine Dalaka is a co-author of the book. She is an American legal scholar, and she was previously with the Center for International Law. She is now with the Norwegian Center for International Law at the University of the Arctic in Tromsø. Uh, Christine, you have 10 minutes, please. Thank you for the, for the very kind um, introduction, Prof. Ko, and, um, and greetings from Edinburgh, Scotland, where I am. The sun is, seems <laughs> to be coming out. <laughs> Um, for, for a brief bit, um, I'm in town for my daughter's graduation, so it's so nice that I'm able to pair these two very important events. So without further ado, excellencies, fellow participants, distinguished guests, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, I'm immensely grateful for the opportunity to deliver the opening remarks on the book that I had the honor of co-authoring with the late Ambassador Satyanandan. First, I would like to thank the NUS Center for International Law for not only organizing this event, but for supporting this book project. Ambassador Nandan and I were buoyed by the support of our many friends and colleagues at the center, both past and present members. Today, I would like to ex extend my particular thanks and appreciation to Prof. Jaya Kumar, Prof. Tommy Ko, Prof. Robert Beckman, and Dr. Nilifer Oral. Thank you all very much indeed. In preparing these remarks, I was reminded of a statement that I had helped Ambassador Nandan prepare for an event in 2018. In the end, Ambassador Nandan decided to conduct the event as a dialogue and did not deliver the statement. Today, as we celebrate Ambassador Nandan's service to the law of the sea and reflect on the international law year in review, I believe it is both timely and appropriate for me to deliver the launch of his book in a bridge version of the statement that he prepared. In the words of the late Ambassador Nandan, I thought I may share some of my thoughts on ocean governance together with reflections on my approach to the making of the 1982 convention and its implementing agreements. My hope is that studying the past may illuminate a way forward. On ocean governance, I have three thoughts I would like to share with you. First, the convention must serve as the foundation of effective ocean governance. It is important to note that the convention is not a static instrument. While it contains norms which are precise, it also establishes principles which lend themselves to further development of the law of the sea. There is an inbuilt flexibility which allows for the development of new norms within the framework of the convention in response to evolving circumstances and increased awareness of the physical environment of the ocean and its resources. Second, effective ocean governance requires an integrated approach. Without proper coordination, there is a risk of policymaking leading to the inconsistent implementation of the convention. It is therefore only logical that an integrated approach to the different uses of the ocean and the development of its resources is adopted in the implementation of the convention, either through existing instruments or the development of new ones. Third, effective ocean governance requires cooperation and coordination. It is important that the principles of integration that are applied at the national level are also applied at the regional and global levels and the appropriate linkages are established between the various levels of governance. I would like to share my thoughts on how such a form formulation of effective ocean governance may in fact be achieved. Recently, I've been working on ocean issues and developments within the context of the making of the convention as part of a book project that I've been working on with CIL. Our primary aim is to provide a resource that will, will complement and enrich the existing literature on the law of the sea by defining my approach to consensus building diplomacy, as well as providing a personal recollection and narrative of the events surrounding the making of the modern law of the sea. 
In reflecting on my negotiating style and methods through this project, I found that I use the following three devices or methods, either singly or in combination, to bring about consensus-based solutions. One, the use of a text. Two, the application of an equitable approach. And three, the exercise of creativity. Although we have elaborated more fully on my approach in the book, I offer a brief description of each of these three working methods. First and foremost, I am a strong proponent of the use of a text. My underlying method is having a piece of paper prepared in order to create momentum in negotiations. By leading with a text, it gives people something to focus on. I used a text in large conference proceedings to consolidate support around certain ideas and concepts in an effort to find a compromise position. I also used a text in the small informal negotiating groups that I chaired in the course of the third conference and later in the negotiations I led on the Part 11 Implementation Agreement and the UN Fish Stocks Agreement. The second working method that I've relied upon in my career is the application of an equitable approach. And working on this project, my use of a sense of equity became readily apparent. While I was attending law school in London, I discovered that the idea of finding equitable solutions to seemingly intractable issues was a very useful way to resolve outstanding issues. Lastly, creativity, when exercised pragmatically, was a key component of my approach to multilateral negotiations, as demonstrated in my frequent use of language to reach consensus. I have a passion for language, and I often consulted three different dictionaries during the third conference, searching for language to create agreement. I found that the right choice of words could be used to bridge differences between opposing views. Undoubtedly, major challenges will continue to arise as we seek to manage the ocean and its resources in the face of increasing pressure from rapid technological development, increased scientific research, and of course, concerns for the marine environment. It is my hope that the challenges will be addressed through increased international and regional cooperation and coordination and through a flexible and creative approach to the negotiation of new instruments, together with the implementation of the principles and norms expressed in the 1982 convention and related agreements. In closing, I would ask the next generation of lawyers, diplomats and scientists to work together to find common ground to solve the problems that imperil the health of the world's oceans. In doing so, my hope is that the convention, together with the various methods and devices we use to arrive at the convention, will serve as a framework that will guide and inform future negotiations and decision-making. Thank you all for your kind attention and for the opportunity to share Ambassador Nandan's words and reflections with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine, for reading out that statement by Satya, very inspiring. The second speaker is Michael Lodge, who is probably joining us from Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, Michael was very close to Satya, and he's currently the Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority, and had previously worked with Satya in the Pacific with the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission. <coughs> Michael, over to you. Thank you, Tommy. Good uh, morning from Jamaica uh, to everybody. It's uh, great to be here. And uh, let me start by joining uh, other speakers in congratulating the university and the center on the publication of this volume yes. of Satya's reflections on his contribution to the law of the sea. As you said in your introduction, Tommy, it is a very important book. Yes. And I especially wish to congratulate Christine for all her efforts in compiling yes and organizing the manuscript. Without her, uh, this book would not have been possible. Those of us who knew Satya well and worked closely with him are very well aware of how challenging it could be to get him to commit words to paper. Whenever he was asked to write a statement or put something down on paper, he would constantly prevaricate and get distracted by telling stories <laughs> or going on intellectual diversions. So because of this, working with Satya could be simultaneously frustrating because of his insistence on rewriting every sentence over and over again, but also enlightening because of the insights it would give into his vast knowledge of the law of the sea. He often said, in fact, that the reason he considered himself to be a poor public speaker 
was that he would be constantly rewriting his speech in his mind as he read it out. Mm -hmm. Certainly mm -hmm. the writings and speeches of Satya that have the most resonance today are the ones that he completed often minutes before the event was due to start, such as his statements at the conclusion of the Fish Stocks Conference, which he was still drafting, I remember, when the meeting started, and also on the adoption of the 1994 agreement. Well, there are certainly many lessons to be learned from this book about Satya's unique approach to negotiations and consensus building, not least the way in which he would spend considerable time to identify precisely what were the areas of agreement and areas of disagreement between the parties before even beginning to propose any solution. He often advised me, don't put solutions on the table too early. You need to let everyone exhaust themselves before they will be ready to discuss an agreement. That is when you put text on the table to offer them a way out. Again, I would commend Christine on having successfully captured his voice throughout yes. this book. In the short time available to me today, I want to highlight three characteristics of Satya that I think contributed him, to him being such a successful diplomat and negotiator, and that certainly contributed to his success in achieving the implementing agreements of 1994 in 1995. First, he strongly opposed unilateral action and believed in a multilateral approach to resolving problems through the rule of law. He frequently said, and it is restated in this book, that the greatest achievement of the convention is that it has curtailed the exercise of omnipotent power over our ocean through the establishment of the rule of law. I agree with Satya that today this achievement is often underestimated or not sufficiently recognized. We must do everything we can to protect the integrity of the convention. Second point, he disliked ideology in all its forms. He described himself as a moderate on all issues and considered that extreme positions on either side were an impediment to consensus. The solution for Satya always lay somewhere in the middle. For this reason, in negotiations, he refused to use square brackets, which for him reflected a zero sum game where it was either my language or your language. Instead, he would spend hours to try to find new language that would present a compromise that both sides could accept with honor and without relinquishing their initial ideological position. This would be a good lesson to remember today, where international negotiations are increasingly confronted with extreme ideological positions, including a growing environmental absolutism and dogmatism, bordering on fanaticism in some places. We should remember that things are rarely as bad as they appear and rarely as good as they appear. The aim should be to seek balance in all things, including a balance between conservation and sustainable use of resources that is reflected, in fact, in the Convention. And the third point, he believed sincerely in the power of the Convention and its related implementation agreements to deliver sustainability and prosperity as long as they are applied robustly and fully operationalized. This was exemplified through his work in developing the Regional Convention for the Fisheries of the Western Pacific between 1997 to 2000, and his work after his retirement from the International Seabed Authority in chairing the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission. He deplored the fact that in too many cases, there was a lack of political will to implement internationally agreed frameworks. We see this too often today, where there is frequently a rush to respond to problems by legislating rather than rigorously implementing existing provisions. One reason both the two implementing agreements have been so successful is that they are highly practical 
and pragmatic documents. I believe we would do well to remember these lessons, particularly in the context of the many challenges to the integrity of the convention that we are confronted with today. Even in international negotiations that threaten to undermine provisions in the convention that were the product of years of debate. Before attacking the convention for its perceived defects, it is useful, I believe, sometimes to stop and think and ask ourselves, where would we be without the convention? So I hope that the younger generation of Law of the Sea experts and diplomats would take the time to read this book and study the messages that are contained in it. It is well worth your time. And again, congratulations to Christine, to the center and to the university for its initiative in publishing this book. Thank you very much. Back to you, Tommy. Oh, thank you, Michael, for a very wise statement. Thank you. The next speaker is Senior Judge Chow Higdin of Singapore. Higdin was uh, Satya Nandan's, one of his closest friends. Uh, Higdin, you have the floor. Thank you, Tommy. It is a, a very heavy heart that I come before this distinguished gathering to speak about a giant of the law of the sea. A very dear old friend, Ambassador Satya Nandan. I knew a few years ago that he was writing this book, and I had hoped to see him being present yeah. here with us for yeah. his launch. But that is not to be. Instead, we are here to witness the launch of the book in his memory. The world owes him a tremendous debt of gratitude for his huge contribution in bringing law and order to the oceans of the world. I am convinced that this will be the law for many, many years to come. The convention and the coming into being of the International Seabed Authority are testaments of his monumental achievements. In this brief address, I do not propose to dwell on Ambassador Ambassador's Anandan's work on the Convention of the Law of the Sea. The book itself would amply give the reader a sense of his achievement in that regard. Ambassador Tomiko, in his introduction, as well as the other speakers before me, have already alluded to the great work done by Ambassador Nandan and his contribution to the international order. In this couple of minutes available to me, I just want to touch very briefly on a few things to show the personal side of him, particularly in relation to him as a father and as a friend. My association with Ambassador Nandan began 50 years ago. My first contact with him was in November 1970. In the fall of that year, I was a member of the Singapore delegation to the 25th anniversary of the UN. At the time, he had just lost his wife on the birth of their son, Kumar. Until Kumar went to university in England to study law, Ambassador Nandan would regularly come to Singapore because Kumar was being taken care of by his maternal grandparents who were then residing here. Ambassador Nandan had great attachment and affection for Kumar. He sometimes mourned that as a single father in New York and with a job at the Fijian mission to the United Nations, it was just impossible for him to bring up Kumar in New York. Fortunately, his late wife's parents, who were then hale and hearty, were more than happy to take care of and bring up the child. This enabled him to have the peace of mind to continue working in New York. This arrangement also led him to having to make almost yearly visits to Singapore. On my part, I look forward to his visits too. On every such occasion, we will renew friendship, chat, and have meals together. You may ask, what about him which I like best? He was an easygoing guy with no airs, warm and forthright, good sense of humor. When discussing serious matters, he was very consultative in his approach 
and would readily take in ideas, even if it was something he did not quite agree with. He would not reject it outright and would instead, like a true diplomat, say things like, let's give it a bit more thought or let's think through it. This attribute of his greatly endeared him to colleagues at the Law of the Sea Conference. He was, as previous speakers had said, a consensus builder. His warm, sincere, and gentle mannerism was his hallmark, which enabled him to win friends and convince detractors. Between us, apart from light moments, we did share much time discussing serious work and exploring possibilities on various issues. Apart from work, I share another common interest with him, and that was food. <laughs> One of his favorite dishes <laughs> when he was in Singapore was chili crab. This was and still is a signature dish here. <laughs> Some of you may know that part of Singapore, which was and still is known as Jurong, transformed into an industrial and commercial hub. The end part of that area was called Tuas and it was adjacent to the sea. At the time, there was a collection of restaurants there serving delicious seafood. Ambassador Nandan loved it on our first visit there in the early 70s. At every subsequent visit of his to Singapore, he would remind me of this wonderful place. And of course, we would end up there. Our visit there came to an end towards the late 70s when development took over the place and all the eating houses had to be relocated elsewhere. However, this dish has not disappeared. It has taken roots in many other parts of Singapore. Next, I would like to allude to a matter which demonstrated his warm personality, friendship and hospitality. It was the year 2007. My wife and I were planning to visit our daughter who was residing in Los Angeles. We thought it would be nice to see the International Seabed Authority, which was and still is located at Kingston, Jamaica. Ambassador Nandan was then in SecGen. I emailed him to tell him of our plans and asked whether during that period he would be in Kingston. His reply was no, and that he was likely to be in New York. So I said in that case, Another time, his immediate response was no problem and said that Kingston was just a flight away. I gave him our flight details and also requested him to book a hotel room for us at a location convenient to him. On our arrival, he was at the airport to greet us. We were expecting to stay at a hotel and instead he brought us to his apartment saying that he had a vacant room there. We stayed there for three nights, and during that period, he drove us around the island of Jamaica, showing us the places of interest. A true host indeed. In this connection, I must tell you a funny thing that happened. Before doing so, it's necessary for, to, for me to add that some 20 or more years ago, before our trip to Jamaica, of course, Jim, Ambassador Nandan had remarried. On the first evening when we were there in Jamaica, his wife called up to ask him, why was he not home yet? Apparently, he told his wife that he were, he, we were coming to Jamaica. In his mind, he thought he had also told her the dates. That morning, when they left home for the airport, his wife was still half asleep when he said to her that he was going to the airport. He thought she would have remembered. <laughs> I felt the need to relate this visit to Jamaica to show the measure of the man as a friend, always warm and hospitable. Finally, with Ambassador Nandan's untimely departure, what is left now for me are sweet memories of a great friendship. In some ways, I've learned through him what grace and kindness means. For you folks who are gathered here this afternoon, let me say a big thank you for giving me this opportunity to share some of my personal thoughts of the man with you. I thought you may like to hear these things. Thank you again. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you very much, Hiktin. The final speaker this afternoon is Myron Nordquist, but Myron's not able to join us, but he's written a statement which he's asked Christine to read on his behalf. Can I ask you, Christine, to, to read out Myron's uh, statement? Christine? Yes, sir. Or, yes, of course. Yes. Um, now, I uh, again, yeah, Myron again wasn't able to join, so I, I'm, you know, I'm very honored to deliver this statement on his behalf. And so, please, if everyone if you could bear with me once again, uh, in the words of Professor Myron Nordquist, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the sponsors of this conference, uh, the NUS Center for International Law, invited me to speak at the launch. Uh, of the late Satya Nandan's book written with Christine Dolliker. The book is entitled Reflections on the Making of the Modern Law of the Sea. Satya Nandan was a close friend of my family for over four decades. He and I worked together for many years, which included productive months at the Third United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea negotiations. Satya was a skilled diplomat who made many substantive contributions to the peaceful order of the oceans. His contributions were comparable to just a few others, such as Tommy Coe of Singapore, who was the president of the third conference. My remarks today will focus on just one period of Satya's long life. My reason for this approach is to offer one example of many available to illustrate the value of this book. The period selected hopefully provides a manageable focus suitable for these remarks. Events occurred during his activities in 1975 when Satya was rapporteur of the second committee at the third conference in Geneva. For this book, Christine personally interviewed Satya numerous times on the wide-ranging international events in his life. She also was given unique access to his personal notes. In that regard, this book was a joint effort, and Christine, by her diligent and thorough research in this book, has also made a historic contribution to the law of the sea. Satya was an extraordinary public servant for his native Fiji, the United Nations, the International Seabed Authority, and UNCLOS viewed as a whole. We are fortunate indeed that with CIL's support and Christine's hard work to gain insights into Satya's thinking, his deeds have been preserved from humankind, not the least of which are for serious Law of the Sea scholars. My relationship with Satya started at the UN General Assembly in the early 1970s, shortly after the Principles Resolution was adopted, when Satya was a young diplomat from Fiji posted to its UN mission in New York. When the conference officially started in 1973, Satya was elected as a representative of the Asian Regional Group to serve as rapporteur of the second committee under a chairman selected by the Latin American group. The second committee, following the list of subjects and issues adopted for the conference, was assigned the most important substantive issues at the third conference. These included the Territorial Sea, Innocent Passage, International Straits Transit, the Archipelagic Regime, the Exclusive Economic Zone, which we commonly refer to as the EEZ, fisheries, the Continental Shelf, the High Seas, and the Regime of Islands. The focus of this, of this limited scope of my comments today is on the single article in the 1982 Convention pertaining to islands, Article 121. The substantive session of the third conference opened in Caracas in 1974 with well over 100 countries giving for the first time ever an outline of their general positions on the law of the sea. This opening stage was followed by states submitting literally hundreds of detailed proposals based on the list of subjects and issues assigned to the three main conference committees. The second committee dealing with the traditional law of the sea had of course to deal with literally hundreds of official proposals. The conference faced a daunting task to reach the required text for a draft convention as the conference moved to Geneva for its next negotiating session in 1975. The only realistic way delegates avoided a political deadlock and conference failure given competing state proposals was to adopt unique procedural rules for the conference. The delegations knew that they had to provide a fair reading and review of each of the proposals from many contending states. Moreover, the conference had to proceed on a consensus basis and its task of reaching an agreed text. Delegations resolved the problem of draft drafting a single negotiating text by bestowing an unprecedented procedural power on the chairman of the three main conference committees. Each chairman was asked by the conference delegates to prepare language for a draft convention text. The text was then to be submitted to his full committee, allowing all delegates to review it. Satya's role in 1975 thereby immediately involved into drafting the, tech, the textual proposals for the second committee's chairman. 
So this extraordinary step was seen as the only practical way to obtain a single text at this stage of the negotiations. A single text was seen in 1975 as critical for the success or failure of the third conference. Here it is noteworthy that the draft submissions from the second committee to the plenary committee of the conference were written in English rather than in Spanish. The reason is that Rapporteur Nandan and the few you and staff who did the actual draft reading, um, reading and writing um, wrote, it, wrote in the um, in English language. Further noteworthy for the limited focus of these remarks is that both Satya, Satya and Gudmunder Eriksson, who was who was his a junior diplomat in aiding him, were from island states. By their backgrounds, they understood more than most delegates about the complexity posed by islands throughout the world and their controversial status, particularly with respect to disputed ownership of associated ocean entitlements. No records were kept of their drafting activities, but informal working group meetings were sometimes held on particular articles that were open to all delegations. As a matter of official conference history, the drafts submitted to the chairman of the second committee by Satya Nandan were accepted, adopted, and forwarded to the second committee plenary just as he had written them. Even more amazing is the fact that the text that set out the regime of islands and was to become Article 21 remained substantively unchanged from what Satya drafted and handed to his chairman in 1975. To make the point clear, Note that Satya's language for Article 121 remains sub subsequently unchanged, despite a detailed review of the text in full committee meetings from 1976 until 1982. His, his, excuse me, his draft, as submitted in 1975, is now the Article 121 text of the 1982 convention. In the case of the regime of islands, we find that paragraph one of Article 121 reads, an island is a naturally formed area of land surrounded by water, which is above water at high tide. This language, selected for the single negotiating text in 1975, originated in Article 10 of the 1958 Convention on the Territorial Sea and Contiguous Zone, which in turn was taken from slightly modified language drafted by the International Law Commission in 1956 for the first conference on the law of the sea. Unlike the first conference, the International Law Commission was not tasked to prepare draft treaty provisions for the third conference. The third conference negotiations could have saved a great deal of time, energy, and angst had it started in 1974 with what was equivalent to a single negotiating text for most articles. In any event, the words naturally formed in Article 121 were not only familiar to most delegations, but also part uh, but also part of the legal lexicon for many countries at the third conference. Satya wisely selected these exact words for his text and second chairman Galindo Pohl of El Salvador readily endorsed this text for the single negotiating text draft of Article 121.1. The second paragraph of Article 121 just repeated the 1958 convention's general concept that treated islands as having the same ocean space entitlements as other land territory. The problem now, however, was that the new 200 mile EEZ and expanded continental margin claims at the third conference vastly increased the reach and expansion of the island um, ocean entitlements. Most of this expansion was in the international area beyond national jurisdiction, which now um, had been deemed the common heritage of mankind. The landlocked and ge geographically disadvantaged group led in large part by Tommy Coe was a major political force in the negotiations by 1975. Sati obviously decided it was necessary to reduce the entitlement of islands to make the island re regime more acceptable. A new paragraph three exception for rocks was seen by Asati as necessary to reduce the impact of island entitlement. Rocks that could not sustain human habitation or an economic life of their own, presumably rocks under international law still would raise the territorial sea and contiguous zone. A third paragraph of Article 121 thus contains a new rule of international law. Satya and his small group of fellow draftsmen in 1975 deftly employed the well-established drafting technique of deliberate ambiguity to encapsulate this new rule. By doing so, the draftsmen hoped that contending sp spokesmen on contested island regime issues would compromise sufficiently to accept the new rule in the UNCLOS in the context of the tide of political pressures to achieve a convention.
The 121 reference to a naturally formed area of land for an island definition unfortunately remained unclear. The main reason is that it is not obvious when the required natural formation must take place. Possibilities from the text could include when the Big Bang created the universe, when the continental masses drifted apart, when Cap right. Captain Cook marked his charts, when a volcano yeah. erupted, or even when a dispute settlement case required a determination. Finally, we might remember that Satya made a special historical impact for the newly in independent state of Fiji when he deposited in 1982 the first ratification of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. He was the first in line, even at the end. My bet right. is that he's still smiling with satisfaction about that. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, Christine. And can you please convey our appreciation to Myra Nordquist? Um, it now gives me very great pleasure. It now gives me great pleasure to pronounce the book launch. And I now return the, <laughs> the microphone to Tara. Um, thank you, Prof. Ko. We actually have a short video uh, yes. prepared by um, uh, CIL. Okay. Uh, Matthew? Thank you, Matthew. That was well. That, that was lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Ko and um, the panelists for all those very touching tributes of um, one of the most important figures in Law of the Sea. Uh, without further ado, we've actually come to the close of the <laughs> International Law and Review Conference. Five and a half hours, nearly five and a half hours later, uh, you know, passed. Uh, thank you very much to all the participants for sticking with us. And um, I would like now like to hand it over to Nilifa for some closing remarks. <clears throat> well, thank you so much. First, uh, I have to thank uh, all the speakers, the moderators, the participants, this was really almost a marathon. <laughs> we did have quite a bit, quite a few panels covering so many topics uh, for Zoom. Uh, so I'm really grateful for all of you for participating. And of course, a very special thank you to our fantastic CIL team. Um, Tara, uh, you did a wonderful job moderating and I know it was not easy for you to have to keep people on time, but you brilliantly. Uh, it really made it, it was very important and you did a great job doing that. And I hope if there's any fault, please, I take full <laughs> responsibility if anyone has been offended. <laughs> and then of course, uh, I have to thank Emil Valdez for all his diligent efforts, but we can never forget our fantastic events and manager, uh, Jerry Ng and her associate, Matthew Yao, 
Uh, I just cannot tell you how much hard work goes into preparing this. And of course, uh, what would we do without Professor Tommy Coe? Uh, you inspire us, you really do. Uh, and Professor Jaya Kumar as well and everyone. I just can give my eternal gratitude uh, for everyone who has participated in this and for supporting us and joining us and keeping CIL rolling strong despite the pandemic. <laughs> so thank you everyone. Thank you and I hope I didn't forget anyone. <laughs>